<clears throat> well, uh, Beth, thank you so much for helping out my project. Um, I, I mean, I know you do the casual um, space uh, podcast and you're an ISS uh, communicator for NASA and uh, analog astronaut and a, a gazillion other things. But uh, if you wouldn't mind, could you say a few words about yourself? Sure. I did work at NASA for the years that I was witness to the assembly of the International Space Station, which was so great. I also worked in public affairs where I got to help write and explain to the public what we do as an agency in space and where your tax dollars are being spent. So I captured those stories and shared them with everyone. That That's awesome. I, um, this past February, actually, um, kids went off to college and I was like, well, you know, if I'm never gonna pursue that dream job, uh, if I don't pursue it now, I'll never pursue it. So I actually, I just joined up NASA in, in, in February and I'm working on the uh, um, ISS, um, uh, well, it's called the Spartan team now. Um, oh they, do the, they do the electrical power systems and the external thermal control systems for the uh, ISS. So um, I love that part of your story. You're like, now that the kids are gone, time for me to play. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. How are you liking it so far? Oh, it's it's great. I, I never went to space camp, but if I had gone, I would imagine it'd be like this every day. <laughs> oh, I believe you. Yeah, space camp, NASA, it's all it's all part of the process. Yeah. And it's just amazing. I mean, in addition, like this coming Tuesday, I'll get to sit um, kind of shadowing the, I'm still a trainee. It's gonna be like another year before I get certified. Um, but I'll be shadowing like the, the person on console as we're doing the, uh, EVA to uh, roll out the new solar uh, array. And so I'm like, so excited about that. And I got to see, Fred uh, I got to see Fred Hayes talk, who was like oh the, the last, uh, you know, so, uh, la uh, the only Apollo 13 astronaut that's still alive. Yeah. And uh, Gwen Shotwell came by last Tuesday and talked with Vanessa. And it was so exciting to get to hear her. So it's just like, uh, it's it's fantastic. Oh, Nathan, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, but I, I started this project back in uh, 2019, back whenever um, there was an administrator at NASA uh, that was tasked with getting us to the moon by 2024. And he had a little lapel pin that he was counting down the days to the end of 2024 mm -hmm. and going around NASA selecting a, a, a NASA employee of the day to kind of highlight. And I thought uh, it'd be cool to just interview any and everybody to get their perspective. I love your project. This was so cool. I, I'm so glad. I um, it, it's been uh, really uh, neat to go up to people at Starbucks and say, "Hey, did you know we're going back to the moon?" Yeah, and they're like, "We are." <laughs> we are. And, and yes, yes, that that is it. And and it kind of brings me to um, a topic I wanted to get your perspective on, since you're a professional communicator with NASA experience. Um. Why is it so hard for NASA to, to kind of get their message out there to the general public? This is forever the question. There are two questions. Why are we spending money? And why don't we get like the most incredible support? And I think science in space is not immediate. You invest now and your ROI comes many years later, years. A great example is the Hubble or more recently the James Webb Space Telescope. And you think about how people have worked on that project for 10 years, not just to build it, that was an additional 10 years, but to launch it and prep it and get it transported and then finally see it working, it takes time. And I think we humans are very impatient. I think we want things immediately. We dream big and we want those dreams to be fulfilled with big results. And when it comes to space, because of the environment being so difficult and let's be honest, so unfriendly to humans, that environment has to be protected, we have to be protected within it. And it's not something that we can just step in and out of in our immediacy or in our, you know, perspectives, we have to really put that part in the equation. And I think a lot of people are not always patient. It's kind of like, 
Well, we do big, brave things here on earth, and we've come a long way in a short time, but that doesn't always equate. You can't necessarily take exactly that and apply it to space. So I think people have trouble. I know I do too. I'm like, well, if we did it in the ocean, can't we do it in another extreme environment? No, space is very, very different. So I think people have a lot of disconnect when it comes to that. And they feel like if they can't understand it, or if they don't have the long term game patience for that, then people are like, it's then I'm not interested. Let's move on. Uh, and, you know, another kind of aspect that uh, sort of is tangential to this is, you know, back whenever you were covering the um, assembly of ISS, uh, mm -hmm. NASA essentially was the uh, center of all American space activity. Yeah. And uh, since then, uh, we've seen uh, SpaceX, who's on track to do like 60 launches this year. Uh, I know. Who's I know. So I mean, they. I mean, if you missed this week's launch, well, maybe you'll make next one. You know, uh, now, you know they've uh, sent supplies to International Space Station. They send astronauts to International Space Station. They send astronauts, uh, you know, uh, in orbit uh, on their own missions. Uh, they're building a fully reusable spacecraft that might be as transformational as going from like the right flyer to like the seven forty seven in uh, terms of <laughs> really. Yeah, and I guess in, in all of this, um, it seems like um, NASA's role isn't quite as um, well defined. I mean, it's not as clear as, as where, where 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 NASA actually is. And I was just wondering, you know, with with all your kind of perspective of being inside and outside and all around this issue, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, I think NASA's role is sometimes misunderstood. And that is, first of all, it's foundational. You know, SpaceX can't do what it does without a deep space network to communicate, to launch. There's a lot of things that other companies are going to be able to do because NASA started or NASA built the foundation. So NASA has always been the leader in that. And I think they've always set out to do that. And then when we talk about what you mentioned earlier, my privilege of working on station, you know, everyone is like, oh, station is old and station is about to retire and station is about to be decommissioned. This is all true. And yet we've had over 20 plus years, I think we're going on 23 of a international space station that has been the most peaceful international peacetime engineering project ever humanity's ever done. And yet it was always intended to end. It was always intended to have three segments, which was the assembly segment, and then this um, working and developing and living in space. And then it was always, always intended to be the stepping stone for commercial partners to take what was started and build upon that. And that's exactly what Axiom is going to be doing now. That's exactly what other institution researchers, academics, they've all been able to build off this platform, both literally and figuratively in space when it comes to the spin-offs we've created and the technologies we've designed. So that was always intentional. So I feel like NASA often gets misrepresented when they say things like, well, how come NASA isn't in on this? Or how come NASA is not doing reusable rockets? Or how come NASA? And I always remind everyone, NASA always is very clear and very intentional with their plans. And NASA has a limited budget. So NASA performs incredibly well when they set out to say, this rocket will accomplish these things and return or go to this place and accomplish the mission. And they do. And in addition to that, companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are not yet going to other planets, observing exoplanets, putting money back into space and Earth research equally. Um, looking at the oceans, looking at our natural environment and high altitude that surrounds our Earth. NASA does all of these things and more. So we can't just look at one rocket or one station and say, 
boy, NASA's has really fallen off. They're not really competing with some of these other companies. No, they're not. They never intended to. And that's not going to be what they're really good at. They're going to follow projects as designed and with the money they're allotted. And you know, most of the things NASA does with those projects so focused live way beyond their life expectancy, like the Mars rovers, like the International Space Station, like Cassini and planetary probes. And so that's why um, I'm always defensive when it comes to some of the NASA projects, because I think people compare it to the new shiny thing that's up and coming in the space industry. And they're like, you know, they get either disappointed or they get confused. And I'm like, no, no, here's NASA's portfolio. I mean, you can look just behind me on the wall. These are all NASA commissioned artwork. And it's all the places in space in which NASA has either been or is going or has a presence. So when uh, SpaceX's wall and Blue Origin and the other companies have this to show as well, then we'll be apples to apples, right? <laughs> uh, indeed. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely exciting times. And you know, talking about the ISS and what a, a monument it is to kind of global cooperation and uh, doing something together. Um, I mean, it, it seems like deorbiting it seems like a, a bad, uh, too, too metaphoric for the current state of international affairs. Right. Uh, I, have you heard anybody actually talk about maybe, you know, preserving it in some way? Well, sure. I mean, NASA's going to make it run as long as they possibly can safely. So important. And then this, this uh, segue into taking station and breaking it apart and putting it into other stations. And I don't mean literally, I just mean the idea of this platform that works and applying that into the new technology. You know, it is sad. I know our hearts are in it and I know mine certainly is. But you have to remember the way that you move forward is with things that are newly developed and they can last longer. We've discovered new material sciences. We've discovered better ways to live and work. We've, oh goodness gracious, it's been years, Nathan, since we've had new spacesuits for EVAs. Mm -hmm. Those are fundamental and yet we've gone years. I don't know what's older, some of those suits or the space station. And if okay. you think about that, which one would you want to put on? I mean, something new or something that's 25, 30, 40 years old? Oh my word, I want a new suit. I want a new suit. <laughs> so it is, it is sad. I know I was even sad when Cassini, you know, went into the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, these things are projects that people work with their blood, sweat, and tears and hours. And I certainly am going to be definitely sad when station is complete, but it sure did com accomplish everything it set out to do and more. And it, it's, it's really amazing. I, and there's so much it has to teach us just kind of like random stuff. I mean, um, you know, as is orbiting the earth, right? Uh, I, I mean, this, this thing called the Southern Atlantic anomaly. I mean, I had no clue that such a thing existed. Oh, you have to and tell me. Well, apparently there's like this this area in like off the coast of Brazil where like Earth's magnetic field is weaker, and as the International Space Station passes over it, uh, you're more uh, likely to have like bit flips and communications issues and things like this. And it's kind of like just a random thing that either you don't know know about or or even think about it, or you know about it and you're just like, oh, it's an everyday thing. But you know making that transition like, wow, that's kind of an interesting feature about the earth that I would have never known if I didn't have to actually worry about uh, kind of staying in communication with this, this vehicle that's going uh, around the earth. And, you know, it's, it's kind of random little thing, yeah. but it, it's, it's highlighted on the world map. If you look at the uh, ISS map, that's at yeah. the, of, uh, the mission control. That area. Yeah. yeah and a lot of area. people, a lot of people don't know as well. That's great, Nathan. I learned that today. Yeah. Um, if I had learned it once, I'd have forgotten. But there are a lot of people who don't understand when people and astronauts come back, how we have to have that um, two minutes. Sometimes it can be longer or shorter where we're re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and they're like, why doesn't communications work? And you're like, because they literally are fighting friction fire right now. Like nothing will work at those speeds and in those heats. But people forget and that's okay. I mean, 
This is all the nuances and the interesting, you and I call them, we think they're fun facts and they are. And then um, people, you know, who don't otherwise understand uh, space travel and exploration. These are things that all have to be considered and it makes it more challenging. Yeah, it's interesting about the reentry. Uh, that came up in uh, Gwen Shotwell's uh, fireside chat with uh, Vanessa last oh, Tuesday. Oh, cool. Uh, she was saying how she absolutely hates launch days when they launch people. Like she's just like nervous, <sighs> uh, like you couldn't believe. But uh, she said that actually the reentry is like worse for her because at least when you're launching, you have like board systems and you're in communication with the craft. You know what's going on second by second, but those reentries are nerve wracking. You're kind of you know, you, you really have to have a lot of uh, faith and trust. Yeah. Yes. I don't envy that part of her work either. That's just hold your breath kind type type of work right there for everyone, everyone on the team. It's a real moment. I know. But you mentioned something, Nathan, that I, won't, I do want to point out, which a lot of people also are not noticing, but I sure am, which is what you just said, that Gwen just spoke with Vanessa. These are two industry leaders, female industry leaders that just even five, 10 years ago, if you looked around to your left and to your right, you just didn't see. So, so much has been changing. And when we're talking about returning to the moon and we're talking about the first female stepping on the moon, that's what brings me such joy because we will finally, finally be able to say that all of humankind is represented. Oh, so exciting. Yeah, and um, you know, uh, throughout NASA, I see uh, a great diversity of mix of people. Um, you know, like uh, my boss's boss is uh, female and and uh, I would say half our group is probably uh, female. So uh, it's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's it's definitely a big improvement over what we saw in the 1960s. I see that. Yeah. Oh, sure. And and now in these leadership roles, which is so great. It's so great. Uh, but coming back to the moon, uh, I presume as a uh, space communicator that you probably uh, found out at the National Space Council uh, that we were planning to go back to the moon by 2024. And that date really resonated. And I thought, that is really ambitious. And I thought, we'll see. <laughs> we shall see. But yet here we are. I have a poster on the other side of my office that you can't see. And it's it's Snoopy, who is the recognized, you know, mass unofficial NASA mascot. And it says forward to the moon in 2024. And it's just so inspiring because it's like, we put a date, we put a date on it and we're working towards it. Yeah, and you know, I think it really goes back to uh, the former NASA administrator, Bridenstein. You know, he liked to say that uh, you really sort of have two types of risk with these projects, the technical risk, uh, which NASA is uh, very good at dealing with, but then sort of the political risk, which is you're able to kind of get everybody to coalesce around something in the short term, but if it gets dragged out, uh, that that support's just going to uh, dissipate. And um, I, I think 2024 was seen as being the first possible date, uh, as opposed to its realism. Like, it, it, realism seems to um, increase those political risks. Uh, and um, I, I was wondering what you thought about that. Oh, well, we have to be competitive with China, right? And we wanted to make a statement and, and be bold. You know, how do we lead teams and people and systems that are gonna have to expedite and move swiftly? And and let's be honest with um, mindfulness with the budget as well. You know, this isn't like eventually we'll get to the moon and we'll spend and spend until we get there, until we get there. This is like, let's set a goal, let's build towards it and let's make it happen. And I like that about Jim Bridenstine. I thought that was really, really bold. And he was this great, you know, am ambassador for the program for going back. And he also said something that was different, which is the word sustainably, sustainably return to the moon. So making sense of it so that we can go and stay. And that was a whole nother level of the program, which also makes it complex when you're talking about the date, 2024. So um, it's ambitious, 
it's competitive, but it's also with this new goal with sustainability, which changes the game. And uh, Beth, I, I don't mean to uh, take up all your time. I, how much time do we have, by the way? I can do 10 more minutes. Sure. 10 more minutes. Okay. Yeah. So there's definitely a few questions I want to uh, get in there Keep before I, I lose you. Um, so uh, what do you think about us going back? Oh, I think it's way overdue. <laughs> I thought we were going back to the moon. I mean, I wasn't alive when we first stepped a feet, a foot on the moon. Um, I wish I were, but uh, I always, like many people, thought that this program would continue and it just didn't. So we got busy, other things happened, there was international crises, there was political and of course funding. So all of these things are natural parts of progression, but then for us to not return after 10 years and then 20 and then now, you know, 50 years, it is way overdue. Yeah, and I mean, uh, so much so that I think people find it painful that we haven't been going back, that they, they've gone as far as to say, have we ever gone? You know, I, I feel like that that's some ways of people kind of insulating themselves from the pain of this deterioration. Yeah, because, because generations like mine and me have not seen us do this. And um, one of the other things about going back to the moon is the stepping stone to Mars. And I don't know if some of your other folks have talked about this, but you know, we have to master that. We have to master living on the moon and transporting to the moon and taking our supplies and ourselves to the moon. And when that is mastered, we move on to Mars. Now, some people are going to just go straight to Mars. <laughs> Good luck, that's tough. It's much further, it's much more difficult, it's totally different, but okay if you want to run before you walk some people do and that's fine and some companies are looking to do that but i think it was really wise and really um it just seemed like a natural progression to say let's go to the moon learn how to live far away from earth and then do it towards mars and there's going to be so many lessons learned um, there's going to be a gateway program that's going to help us access the moon there's going to be permanent stations that will live and help us live on the moon. I mean, these things are going to happen over the course of the next several years and decades. So for us to be so ambitious to say, let's go to the moon and to Mars at the same time. Okay, but I think the moon is right here, closer and more available. And if we can, if we did it in the past, let's use that knowledge and do it again, go back sustainably so that when we go to Mars, we have some things already tested and tried and true so that we are confident in when we humans go to Mars. Now, that totally makes sense to me. Um, and, uh, you know, you talk about things we have to learn. I don't think people completely realize how dependent the astronauts are on their teams down here on Earth. And when you go to Mars and you're out of communication with the Earth or definitely out of uh, real time communication with Earth, you have to be able to solve those problems yourself, you know, and that's a completely different skill set that we've been training for. Totally. When we do our analog astronaut missions, we try to mimic those communication delays as true as possible. So we have sometimes minutes delays in our communication with mission control, and sometimes we have hour delays with communication uh, for mission control, and it is tough, especially imagine if you're in an emergency situation or if you need to get some kind of real time update before you go out for an EVA or maybe during your EVA you're finding something that needs to be addressed and you have to wait 20 minutes. That's just not going to work. It is so much harder than I think people realize. Now, if you look out at the future of humanity, like 200 years, where mm -hmm. do you think we would have gotten to by then? We're going to have more space stations, probably those that are either partnered with other, other countries, and many countries are partnering on stations, or we're going to each country will have their own station. I think that will happen. I think commercial partnerships and commercial space entities are going to be the minority. And I think, um, oh, I'm sorry, NASA will be just 
operating in as it has with deep space and taxpayer budget and exploring planetary science and everything that it has always set out to do. But I think commercial space will be the majority of what we're going to be seeing in space. And I'm looking forward to that because if they have the money and some of the quick available turnarounds to take payloads and build quickly and the staff and the engineering and the innovations to do it go that's i mean there's nothing wrong with that so i would i would suspect to see that i think we'll be fully living on the moon and i think we'll just get started i hate to say that 200 years it seems like a lot of time and we are moving quickly but I think we're just going to be starting to be visiting and going back and forth to Mars because Mars is not Earth. Everything is going to be difficult. Breathing, eating, living, all of the natural things we, we do here is going to be really, really difficult. So unless Mars comes up with some kind of oasis that's contained that people are drawn to and they want to go live that way, I don't see us truly, truly living off planet yet 500 years maybe so 200 years we'll see i'd like to flip that 200 year question around on you okay so let's imagine you don't live in the 2020s instead you live in the um 2220s <laughs> okay you live 200 years in the future okay you're in high school <laughs> uh, you're um in history class and for whatever reason you're, you've decided to write a paper on the 2020s what do you think somebody 200 years from now could look back on this decade mm. and write about? Good question. I like this. For sure, they're going to say earthlings, humans had the data to prevent and correct climate change. Number one, absolutely. They're, we're going to look back in the history books and be like, hmm, it's pretty evident. There it was. We knew it all along. And then politics and everything else, we're going to definitely be able to see where it all began and how we discovered that we were in trouble. And then it'll probably reflect some of the policies and the way in which we're living currently, if I'm in high school and the future 200 years. Whatever I'm doing in my life, I bet if I'm still on Earth, there will be rules and regulations about the way in which I'm living. You know, maybe it's the chemicals we're using or not using. Maybe it's the cars or planes we're driving or using. Everything I bet when we look around in the next 200 years forward will be a reflection looking back at this moment and how we chose to deal with it. Or maybe unfortunately things are really bad and everything I'm looking around and seeing at that time is a reflection of the choices we didn't make um at this time but i also think we're going to be seeing a core of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of citizen astronauts and i think there's going to finally include like teachers artists non-traditional engineering scientific human careers that's a definite i think we're going to have people who not only can just dream about going but they can afford to go and they choose to go whereas right now we're not seeing that but i think in the 200 year mark forward that's definitely going to be a regular thing that i'm really looking forward to as well and then i think because of space we're going to be living differently here on earth i think like i mentioned the climate change and all of the situations we know of now space travel and space exploration will have taught us how to implement some better water filtration, be mindful of our air and space um, and personal space too. And the way we're living, I mean, Americans live in huge houses and we have like huge cars. And I don't think in the 200s, that's gonna be still the thing. I think we're gonna be sharing things. I think we're going to be um, not needing as much space for just, a family of four or one person solo, I think we're going to get really comfortable with being very friendly with each other <laughs> in our personal space. That's uh, that's fascinating. And um, I, so Earth I, is I, small. I, Earth is so much smaller than we realize. It's not unlimited resources. It's our 
beautiful, protected, perfect world. And, you know, we don't need, we don't need as much, I think, as we think we do from it. Um, so I think maybe a good place to, to uh, kind of wrap up things would be, I, I normally ask people, would you go to space if you can? I think that would be a waste of question on you. So <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead, I'd like to ask, um, if you could have any experience in space, Ooh. what would be your ideal sort of space outing? I would love to be able to see an ocean in space and swim in it with my family. That would be amazing. Like instead of the ocean here on earth, maybe we're hovering over some kind of liquid gas formation and we're looking down and we see like all kinds of microbiotic elements that, you know, we've never, we don't usually see on earth. I mean, that would be amazing. That would, and that's out there. That is out there. So for us to go see it would be pretty cool, but I don't need to be so selfish, Nathan, just going to space would be pretty amazing and having the overview effect fully experienced. But I always, I always say this, I don't want it just for me. It feels so selfish. I want this for everyone. I want space to be accessible for everyone. So that would be, if that happens or if the opportunity and accessibility happens, it doesn't matter where I go, but that ocean idea sounds pretty appealing. How about you? Um, you know, it varies from day time to time. I definitely would like to go to the moon. I, I think that'd be great. I just celebrated my, well, back in June, I celebrated my 25th marriage anniversary. And I was telling people to stay in shape because my 50th one's gonna be on the moon. So. I love that. <laughs> Your 50th wedding anniversary, you go together. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, and everybody's invited. You can come too. Yes. <laughs> I'm coming. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you for doing this. I love your questions. These are really thoughtful. Well, I really appreciate it, Beth. And if you know anybody else that'd be willing to have a conversation, I have over 700 more days between now and the end of my project. You do? Oh, yeah. I'm right here. Okay. Um, what about kiddos? I've interviewed people from four to, I think, like 90. So, all right. All right. I'll send some great ideas your way. But I really love that you're doing this. When I stumbled upon it, I was like, what a great project. This is fantastic. And I do want to just pitch if I can. Okay. Um, there is a project we're working on that's called The Stories of Space. And we will be taking stories that everyone can submit to the International Space Station. So they'll go and fly on an SD card to station, but they only have till the end of December to submit their stories. But Nathan, after this wraps up, this is the first time I've ever done a project like this and I'm excited about it, but after our stories get put onto the SD card, it's not over. I wanna take the next evolution of stories to the moon. Because I like again, it. I want to, I want everyone to come with us, right? When we do go to the moon. So um, I'll be working on that over the next several months. And um, if anyone has a stories, it's the stories of space project.com or stories of space.com. And you, anyone can submit a story, any age, any location, any um, story you'd like. So thank you for letting me share that because I feel like that's a way we can connect to the moon and to space by sharing a little bit of ourselves. Absolutely. Storiesofspace.com. I'll have to check it out. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for doing this. It's really been a pleasure. Nice to get to meet you. Likewise, Beth. I hope you have a good rest of your day and look forward to staying in touch. Yes. Have fun at NASA. Say hi to everyone for me. <laughs> Will do. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.